Before I begin, I'd love to introduce my student, Sofia Asagueda. I just butchered her last name before we walked up here. She was like, say it right, Mr. Kite. I totally didn't. You're going to hear more from Sofia here in just a moment. So I would like to start my talk out with a little bit of a story. Growing up, I spent every Sunday morning sitting next to those of you who had a similar upbringing are well acquainted with the hours of boredom that await any six-year-old that has to sit through a two-hour sermon. I am sure Brother Walter had fantastic things to say, but at that age, totally uninterested. My mom always came prepared. She'd pack her purse full of coloring books and crayons, and at the moment she saw me start to squirm, pull them out and tell me to get to work. I love to color. Heck, it even kept me entertained for a little while. But as any of you who have tried your hand at art know, things can go very wrong very quickly. One minute I'd be happily coloring, the next I'd be upset and frustrated because things weren't looking right. Six-year-old hands, just not the best art tools. So in my frustration, I'd always look at mom to either fix the problem or give me something else to do. Her words of wisdom in those moments still reverberate in my brain. Vance, she'd say, there are no mistakes in art, only opportunities for creation. Now, whether she actually dispensed this, world, this pearl of wisdom or not is debatable, but the mantra has stuck with me and the words to her, so I shall claim it. <laughs> Funny thing is, whether she actually said it or not, those words have guided much of my approach to life and my job as an educator. You see, implicitly, my mom was telling me that it was okay to fail, that things wouldn't always work out as planned, and that my response to those unexpected changes would dictate the path forward. Rather than letting me sit and stew in frustration, she was giving me a small lesson in perseverance. Sure, my drawing didn't work out like I wanted it to, but it wasn't the end of the world. I just had to figure out how to move forward. There was a time when I actually wanted to be an artist. I never actually intended to be an educator, just kind of fell into it. I was drawn to the freedom of expression that comes with the job of artist. Think about it. Their whole gig is to draw inspiration from the world around them and then use that inspiration to create something beautiful. Even better if that beautiful thing touches those who interact with it. it sounds kind of like the ideal of education, doesn't it? As I've reflected on the job of artist, I've come to realize that one of the things that sets artists apart from the rest of us is their comfort with risk and failure. The very job of an artist, by definition, is to experiment, to try new things, to always push for creation. Those who embark on the life path of an artist are assured failure along the way. Sometimes that failure will be in the privacy and safety of their studio. Other times, it'll be in full view of the public. If one is to be a productive artist, one has to be okay with taking that risk, with putting themselves out there and with finding a way forward when things don't work out. It's this ever-present failure that causes most parents to forbid their kids from being artists, which is kind of a shame because even though they sometimes exist as eccentrics on the fringes of society, most progress, whether it's technological or educational or social or political, can be attributed to those who are willing to risk in the name of progress. If not for those who view failure as an opportunity for learning, we wouldn't have the internet, light bulb, clean water, modern medicine, or any of the other trappings of modern life that we take for granted. No one ever got a first attempt right. The thing that sets innovators apart is that they took their lumps, learned a lesson, and then they tried again. They didn't give up. They weren't embarrassed, and they weren't deterred from having another go at it. Progressive societies need these brave pioneers. Sadly, it's the rare teacher that is willing to walk this dangerous path. For so many reasons, trying big things in the classroom is a risky proposition. Teachers might be hemmed in by administrators who don't understand classrooms that don't look normal, pressured to perform on the ever-present test, worried about looking like a fool in front of a classroom full of unforgiving teenagers, nudged or outright told by their colleagues not to rock the boat, not to mention the fact that our system really kind of rewards conformity. For all of these reasons, risk-taking in the modern educational environment is a daunting task. It's no wonder that teachers aren't generally known as a risk-taking bunch. But there's hope. Every year, I come to this conference and I am blown away by the things I hear about going on in classrooms. Just yesterday, we heard a highly caffeinated talk by Stephen Ritz, <laughs> who is turning the Bronx into an urban gardening paradise. I have heard of fifth graders involved in 3D printing and modeling. I've heard of shop classes revitalizing their communities by building a farmer's market. I've heard of classrooms connected to their peers on the other side of the world. 
and I've heard of teachers completely reimagining what a classroom can look like. If education is to move forward and the preparation of kids for their futures, classrooms need more teachers who are willing to work like artists, willing to take risks, willing to put themselves out there, willing to be the strange teacher in the building, and willing to question generally accepted methods. The systems that we have in place currently, and more often than not, prepare kids for tests, not their futures. We can't begin to prepare kids for their future until we give them challenges that resemble that future and force them to work in modes that may not be as valued by traditional systems. For the past several years, I've been the strange teacher in the building. Five years ago, I stopped teaching and threw my kids into a nine week long city planning project. This was my first leap into the world of PBL. Three years ago, no training, I completely flipped my AP Bio classroom, then did the same thing the next year with AP Environmental. Two years ago, I was asked to lead a team of ninth and 10th grade teachers in a complete redesign of our freshman and sophomore experience. This past year, it was uh, building prosthetics and 3D printing. I'd love to tell you it's all been ponies and unicorns. But through it all, I have failed publicly more times than I care to remember. I've had criticism from administrators. I have yearly battles with the district over student access to technology, many of which I lose. I've had students pointedly tell me that I'm not teaching them because I don't stand in front of the classroom and lecture. I have had to listen as my colleagues in the other room bash the programs I run because they don't understand them. I've had to push a team of teachers forward in search of authentic PBL work balanced against the reality that the grade of our school hangs on tests taken by their students. Risk is scary and risk is hard. This past fall, I embarked on my scariest adventure to date. Between April and July of 2014, I was fortunate enough to raise the money I needed to purchase a 3D printer, just like the one you just saw up here. With the equipment sitting in my office, actually integrated into my classroom. About that time, I read about an organization called Enabling the Future. As I mentioned just a second ago, the purpose of Enabling the Future is to pair makers with 3D printers with kids who are missing some or all of the fingers on their hand and don't necessarily have the resources to get a traditional prosthetic. I thought, my kids printing and building hands for other kids win, but I had never used a 3D printer. My students had never heard of a 3D printer, and we'd be responsible for making actual medical devices for kids with real medical challenges. What could go wrong? <laughs> so I built a test hand, wrote up the project, and threw it to my students. I could talk for days about what happened next, but I'd prefer to get out of the way and let one of the students who actually participated tell you about her experience. Here's Sophia. So we had just our unit on obesity and our disease in society class, but that's a different story for another occasion. Um, Mr. What Mr. Kai introduced to us was something completely different something unheard of. He said these exact words. Here's a project. I've never done it before. Therefore, you are my guinea pigs. <laughs> OK, maybe he didn't say those exact words, but they are pretty close. He started talking about the Enable campaign and how they helped um, kids in need um, for a prosthetic hand. And it was pretty weird to me. I've never heard of it before. So I started nodding my head thinking, yeah, OK. This is pretty cool. But wait, we're going to be a part of it? How is that even possible? We were going to print a prosthetic hand, and we had no idea how to. Mr. Kite gave us a picture of a kid, which made the experience even more real. My kid was Matthew. He was 12. He was a huge NC State fan, which is why he picked his hand as the color red. And he loved to jump rope. Everything seemed in order and seemed to run smoothly. Let me emphasize on the word smoothly. Our 3D printer broke down for a few weeks, which made us terribly anxious. Um, as we all know, technology is far from perfect. Trust me, you do not want a kid waiting for the 3D hand and waiting forever, it seemed. They had expected a 3D hand to be in their hands before Thanksgiving. They ended up getting it as a Christmas gift. I could say this was the greatest challenge of all. However, let me not let out the little mishaps, 
We had some super glued joints. We had some half printed fingers. They were all over the place. We eventually got them done. Aside from all the things that you wanted to just cry out loud, I would say that this is an unforgettable project. I did learn the basics of using a 3D printer, which is far from anyone could imagine five or maybe 10 years ago. But most importantly, I learned that the power of communication has increased over the years. The Enable campaign allows volunteers to help kids across the country. We even had a kid in California named Johnny, and we were helping him from here in North Carolina. As long as you have the internet and a 3D printer, you can help someone out. I gain respect for these kids in life as a normal kid would, despite their disabilities. They have dreams and ambitions, just like us. They are no different, but making these hands were not a boost to whatever they want to do. It was a great pleasure to be part of this campaign, and I thank Mr. Kite and Enable Project. So to her credit, I totally forgot to give Sophia her clicker to run through. <laughs> um, as you have just heard, projects like Enabling the Future are scary but can have profound impacts on students. Things like Enabling the Future may not directly hit content standards, but they allow kids to build skills that they'll be using for the rest of their lives. Beyond that, they allow them to make a concrete difference in their world, engage deeply in the problem-solving process, and build memories. I would argue that this type of real, complex, Slightly ambiguous learning experience is just the thing that will prepare kids for college, career, and life. I said it before, and I'm gonna say it again. If education is to move forward, classrooms need more teachers willing to work like artists. But I wanna recognize that most real, change in, most real change in schools actually begins with the administration. So administrators, I'm gonna to talk to you first, but before I say anything, that can get me shot. <laughs> Let me recognize the tremendous pressure to perform that is put on you by your districts, superintendents, DPI, not to mention your teachers, your parents, your students, and really anybody else that think they know how you should run your school. I do not envy your position. That being said, during my time as an educator, I have realized that schools ultimately resemble their principals. My first school, the administration was disconnected and detached, Thus was the faculty. I taught under a principal that was frenzied and frazzled but loved all the kids very, very deeply. You know what? The school felt slightly chaotic and didn't have a real clear path towards the future, but every teacher loved every student and did everything we could to get them through our time with us. So your schools are going to look like you. What do you care about? What do you communicate to your faculty, both explicitly and implicitly? Just like you probably tell your teachers, your actions speak louder than your words. Regardless of what you tell us in faculty meetings, the comments that you make in the hallway will bring to light your true priorities. A couple of challenges I would offer. First, clear the path. One of the best principals I ever had told me on my first day of work, my job was to teach, his job was to get out of my path anything that would prevent me from doing my job. I was a better teacher for it. Principals, this is an easy win for you. Right now, think about what can you get out of your teacher's way? Fewer meetings, a couple less emails, maybe release them from some after school duties. Any of those things would automatically clear up time they have to be creative. It also have the added bonus of making them happier. Our principal did it for us and you'd be amazed at what it did for staff morale. Second thing, give us autonomy in our classrooms. Your teachers are crying out to be treated like trusted professionals. We're the ones that are in the classroom with our students day in and day out. We know what they need. Give us the power to meet their needs in the way that we see best, even if it doesn't look exactly like district mandated curriculum. Believe it or not, most teachers actually want their kids to succeed, even on the test. Allow us to do it in the way we know is best for our kids. Which kind of brings me to my next point. Let our classrooms look strange. If you are wandering by and you notice that the kids aren't sitting quietly in geometrically aligned rows, don't be alarmed. I would argue that in many cases, your loudest classrooms might also be your most productive classrooms. When you come in for an observation, quietly in the corner, get in the mix, talk to the students, ask them what they're learning, if they feel challenged, if they're having a good time, if they feel safe. Step back and take a look. Are the kids engaged? Are they collaborating? Are they solving problems? If so, your teacher's probably doing something right. Then, 
there's the elephant in the room. Testing, EOCs, EOGs, standard six, school grades, student proficiency, the whole lot. We know it is there. Don't hang it over our heads. Allow us to get our kids ready. We understand how important school grades and student proficiency is. In high school, we know that the bulk of our school grade hangs on three tests taken by ninth and 10th graders. Give us the power to get them ready in the way that we know is best for our students. Don't make sideways comments about whether it's really appropriate to be doing that activity at this time of the year. I will promise you there is no quicker way to kill teacher creativity and innovation than to continually remind them they need to get their kids ready for a test. My final challenge actually comes with the form of a question, or with a question. What would it look like for you to innovate or to um, initiate a year of risk in your school? Maybe for some of you, it looks like deciding for a full year. I'm not going to think about, talk about, or care about test scores. And I'm going to push my teachers to explore their full potential as educators. For others of you, it might look like pushing for integrated curriculum. Maybe some of you need to go out and find business partners that can help you develop school-wide projects that your students can really sink their teeth into. Any of those things will give you a happier, more creative staff, and happy teachers make happy students. If it's not one of those things, Think about what it looks like for you and your school to stretch in the coming year. All right, teachers, it's your turn. But first, a word of warning. If your principals are going to clear your path and give you autonomy and treat you like professionals, you've got to be worthy of the respect that comes with being an innovative teacher. Pushing the boundaries is hard work. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes iteration, it takes openness, it takes humility you're going to work harder than you have ever worked before. Creating interesting learning experiences is infinitely harder than downloading canned curriculum. You've got to vow not to be an obstacle to yourself or to others. Promise to either actively combat or avoid environments that promote negativity and cynicism. We all know that the teacher's lounge is the most toxic place in a school. Also, if one of your colleagues is trying something new, support them and learn from them. Don't denigrate their efforts. Finally, if you're going to be trusted with the responsibility of innovation, you have got to be faithful in the little things. This means checking and responding to your emails on time, showing up for school before the bell rings, not sneaking in the back door, <laughs> having your lessons planned before you walk into the classroom, keeping up with your grading before it's a mile deep, taking on some leadership. Faithfulness in all of those little things that we deal with on a daily basis is what makes you worthy of doing the bigger things. Now, let's get down to business. Start small. As they say, Rome was not built in a day. For the last three days, all of us have been immersed in all that is innovative in education. If you're anything like me, you got 100 ideas rolling around in your head. And my guess is that those ideas sit on a continuum from rearranging your classroom to throwing all you know about education out the window and starting from scratch. I would challenge you to pick just a little bit uncomfortable. If you pick something that's comfortable, you're not going to be doing anything different. You're just going to maybe add a new twist in your classroom. True innovation is uncomfortable. For me, I think the thing I'll be doing in the coming year is exploring student-directed learning. We'll see how it goes. Second point, as you leap into your adventure, be completely transparent with your students. Let them know you are experimenting in hopes of bettering their learning experience and then invite them into the process with you. Ask them three critical questions. What worked? What didn't work? How can you make it better next time? And then actually incorporate their feedback. Also, as you are being transparent with your students, become okay with saying, I don't know. You're trying something new. Of course you don't know. It's all right. You'd be amazed at how generous your students come, become once they realize their teacher's a person too. They will love going out learning about something, and then coming back and teaching you and their peers all about it. You want student engagement? There you go. All it took is a little humility on your part. Finally, my guess is that some of the ideas you are thinking about take you out of the middle of the educational fray and put your students squarely in the hot seat. For most teachers, releasing the reins of their classroom is a scary proposition. It was for me. It really was. But I have found that properly structured, there is nothing more rewarding than stepping back and watching your kids run the classroom. My happiest days as a teacher recently have been the days that I have walked in 
given my students a challenge and some constraints, gotten them grouped up, then stepped back and just asked and answered questions. That's the kind of situation they're going to be in for the rest of their lives. Why not let them start practicing in the safety of your classroom? Education is in sore need of more artists. Innovation is a risky business that is not for the faint of heart. I would implore you to choose something just a little bit scary and try it out in your classroom this year. Your students will thank you. Now, I want to wrap up by bringing Sophia back so she can tell you why she thinks you all should take an adventure. And I'm going to give her the clicker this time. <laughs> Hi again. Uh, let me tell you about my science software teacher. A young lady who loved talking about social matters. She loved, loved, loved worksheets. These would be the typical worksheets from pre-made workbooks. And you can find the answers directly from the text. Ask me what I remember or learned. Vaguely anything specific. Teachers, this is not only a way to lose our attention in a matter of minutes, even seconds, but it also defeats your purpose. Your job is to help us gain knowledge from you, and it also help us understand it to, in a way to help us teach others or apply it to something else like we would in the real world. If you want us to put in the effort, also demonstrate that you are too. If you come up with an idea to teach a topic, don't be afraid to test it out. At least you are making an effort into, making us, into helping us learn a subject better. I will also give you a tip. Ask us what we like or don't like. Mr. Kite occasionally gives us surveys to see what we like, what we benefit from most, or what we think we learn from most. Students benefit from giving input and letting teachers know what could use some work or what can use some tweaking. And teachers can benefit from knowing what bores us in class or what makes us do great on tests or maybe on even homework if we understand the subject even better. I know your job isn't easy, especially with our attention spans getting shorter. iPhones certainly don't help when they ring in the middle of class, letting us know that there's a Snapchat awaiting us. And probably we open a Snapchat once every day during class. I will admit that I have opened a Snapchat in Mr. Kite's class. But that's not important right now. <laughs> Ask other teachers for ideas or advice for making a deadpan topic into at least a decent one. As I said before, the power of communication increased phenomenally. And there's a whole community of teachers out there willing to give you help and have fun with it. Remember why you fell in love with the art of teaching. Become an innovator and make memorable lessons. And who knows, maybe you will become that teacher that students will like to visit after they graduate. Thank you.